In the city of Leicester and indeed all over England, we receive reports daily of black people being harassed by Her Majesty's police. When I came to Leicester, 1970, and um, I was walking up the high fields and I see these guys selling a magazine called Black Chat. Went over, he says, um, we're selling these to raise money to get um, people, uh, black people aware of the history and things and so on. It was only five piece, and we take one, I said, yeah, I'll have one. We both had one. And we went home and we read it and he says, well, we have, um, we have a blues dance of, to raise money as well, you know, but our offices is upstairs and we have meetings so on a specific time, Fridays or whatever day it was, you know, why don't you come along? And so I says, okay. And they went home and I read the black chat and um, got interested in it. And I thought, yeah. So I said, well, let me go to the meeting and hear what they're all about. And um, the aims and objectives was good, you know. And, you know, for me, what I got from it is that they wanted to educate the, the black people in the high fields or anywhere really, but mainly start with the high fields about the history, about themselves, and to stop listening or taking the, 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 like the shit from the white man then, to put it bluntly. Coming to England opened my eyes because when I come to England, I didn't know nothing about no racism and, and calling people names and all them things. It was just uh, because back home, every time we see a white person, it was like a, you know, like a god or something, because you know they're going to get money off of them and things. You know, you carry their bags or anything like that, and you come over here and we came straight to um, St. Albans. And the first night, we couldn't go out. And I said, well, what do you mean you can't? Because it was cold anyway, but my mom was telling me the stories about people beating up black people and you gotta be careful and you mustn't go out by yourself. If you're going out, it's me and her, me and the dad or whatever. I just start boiling long water. Go and go back home. I'm going to see my grandmother, because I can't deal with this school business. Anyway, eventually we, you know, settled down a bit. A week after that, we went to the, this is when I realized, I went to the government cinema with my cousin, because he's come and take me out, you know what I mean? Because two people can't, two people have to go together, so we went to the cinema. We there, I didn't make it nice, because back home you make nice in the cinema, you know? I didn't make a noise. And the man come down and touch him in, in my face and me, shut up, you nigga. I said, what? Carla said, shh. I said, what do you mean? I said, the man I call, I call with names, eh? what's that name? But I didn't pay no mind to it anyway. So Carla said, come, I said, come there we go, man. Because I know like these people, yeah. Anyway, I start going to school. This is when it really hit me. Three black people in the school, me, my sister, and another guy from Barbados. And these guys, these white guys, flock around me and says, Oh, I like your hair, and let me touch your skin, and this and that. And oh, is that washed off? Or, you know, my mom say you're a nigger, or you know, you know, you're this and that. And I thought, What are these people talking about? And so the guy who was there before us, Bajan guy, he called us to one side and told us what these people are talking about. And then I realized this is a different world. You know, you have, you have to shape up yourself. I came to England in 1959, 18th of September to be exact. I came to Frinsby Park with my little sister to join Mum and Pa, who came upon the Rainwash scheme. I grew up in North London. When I came here, I was eight and a half years old, and everything was strange for me. Everything was black. His clothes, the white man, them way was black. Everything was dark. Maybe because it was autumn, but I don't know nothing about that. It was tough, because outside your family, you have to go out there in white society. So when you go to school, for example, my first school, Stroud Green, 
primary school, me and my sister was probably the only two blacks there when we went there in 1959. And I remember and the toilets was outside. And I remember going into the toilet, doing what you do. And next thing I know, there were some boys looking down on me from up top. I remember them calling me, yes, making what I turned out to be monkey noises, you know? <laughs> monkey. And next thing you know, words like gullywog, you know? Nigger. Now, where me come from, we, we never used those. Those were new to me. But then I was looking at them, and I was just fairly big for my size, so I didn't get that kind of challenge, and I was kind of theistic. But I went home and said to Mom, Mom, I think them boys there has been you don't like me, you know. So then she said, what then, say? She said, they use words like gully wogs and nigger and, and jam jar and all sort of things that, you know, I understand what they must say. She, she said, what did you do? I says, well, I, they were laughing, so I laughed with them. She says, well, keep doing that. Next thing you know, they'll be your best friends. And so said, so happened. When I started motor mechanic, Fred, and he used to call me, he said, um, Ever, Everett, uh, he called me Everett a few times, and he says, um, oh, nigger boy, come over here and, and empty that, um, when he can't, when he can't. So, I used to have a cousin that worked there. I says, this man is out of order. I said, what's he, you can't stand for this shit. So I said, I said, what are you talking about? Who are you calling that? So he came over and started, like he, want, he wants to kick me. I better, I, I, I. So I said, listen, if you do it, it's the last thing I do on this earth. I'm telling you right now. And I tell you, my friend, I just take out my bags and I went home. Never looked back at that place again. Black lads around in London and other places had a horrible time because even your parents was having a horrible time because most of them were laborers. They get up in the morning and they off to work to clock in by eight. By that time you have to manage yourself to get to school by nine or something like that. And you walk in the gauntlet, depending who you meet, depending what words you get or what looks you get. So it was no joy ride. But I think, but for, speaking from a personal point of view, we were young enough to understand and grow it into it. Where my parents and in between the teenagers had a tougher time because some of them didn't go to school and qualification was not there coming from whether Montreal or Jamaica or whatever. And when you go into a, a white uh, factory, you, you have either stand up or, and get the sack because you're not gonna take no bad word from nobody. So it was no joy ride um, during those periods at all. I remember when we was growing up in London, they had this group of people called Teddy Boys. Now, they were racist and still are, because today they call them National Front or whatever name they want to give them. But what they specialize is in coming in gangs to chase black people, particularly the younger ones, in my opinion, because some of the older men them could have stand up for themselves. Until one day, this is now we're coming into the 70s now, about that time, even a little bit before, the Teddy Boys discovered and using their words, fucking hell, the darkies are hard and they carry. And it wasn't love, you know what I mean? As a black man, you couldn't go in town in Leicester by yourself in the 70s. You had to walk with all your friends. Otherwise you get beaten up, simple. So we decided any white man come up to him, um, pass the high field, they get beat up too. But it wasn't, we didn't, we didn't do that. It was just a saying, we didn't do that. Because we had, we had um, white guys who are friends of ours now, friends of mine now, who I know went out there and just kicked the shit out of the policeman then, you know what I mean? You know, just to, just to make a statement and say, well, leave all people alone. Black people today, please organize now against the system of this land. We cannot do anything as individuals. We'll have better effect if we organize together. So do not sit in your homes and grumble. Come on out and tell these racist people that we are not aliens, but human beings and demand to be treated like human beings. 
the key members was um, myself, Malik, Dubois, Zampaladas, Balunda, Coffee, Obeng, uh, Sister Helen, Sister Zizeka. Oh, I mustn't, I nearly forget my friend Roy, Pharaoh. There was a group of fellows there, some not in England now, some has gone to their grave, and so on, some still in Leicester now. It was a bunch of lads. Each of us had an individuality. Pharaoh was the one who, he can talk like Dubois, both of them. He can just talk and get out of any situation. Me and Zed, we were just tell them about themselves and get out and just, if they want to fight, then fight, you know? Um, balloon do the same. When my dad first came to England from Jamaica, um, I think he lived in Preston first and then moved to Bristol because he had an auntie in Preston who he came over to be stay with. And then he moved to Bristol and had three children there. So I've got older siblings there. And then when he came to Leicester, I was the first one he had in Leicester. There were some things I remember I came when I was really young, obviously because racism was rife then with the police and everything. So, you know, I knew he used to get arrested. Um, he'd come back bruised and battered sometimes. I can remember once he was, I think he'd been at the Ravi Club and we was living on Erlau Street and that was on Oxenden Street. I think he was walking home and some white guys jumped him, so he'd come home and I remember that being a bit shaken up because I'd seen him. It was all right. He said he'd give them as good as he got, so that was all right. Obviously, being mixed race, as I got older, it was a bit confusing. The fact that, you know, he had white women and he was so pro-black. Abeng was the, um, I used to call him the intelligent one because he just sit there and write paper and says, right, I'm going to do this and do that. <laughs> Coffee, he was uh, a student as well and he was, um, he was good. He was good with the chat. So we, all of us had a different, a different um, input into it. And then we meet some people in, um, went to Huddersfield for uh, um, a meet, uh, demonstration. And we met these people over there. And they was interested in, you know, they saw a banner, BPLP, Black People's Liberation Party. And they came and talked to us after, and we set up a BPLP in Huddersfield. And they used to come over to us to get the ideas from us, what we're trying to do and things and so on. And we used to go over there, you know, spend a, a night, you know, having meetings with them, having meetings with people and, you know, in different halls and, you know, telling people that this is how we are, this is what we are about. You know, we don't want you to go up there and start kicking up that white man. We just want to tell you, be aware, to think about your history, where you come from, you know, your four parents, you know, because you wasn't taught this, and this is what we're trying to bring to you. Black America was burning because black people are saying, we ain't going to take this no more. And one, one morning, Bernie Miner came as a colored kid. I soon became black. And the terminology, say it loud, I'm black and am I proud, became uh, an emblem for us. Back in the 1950s, there was a shortage of labour workers in Britain. Britain went out of its way to attract black workers to their country. Even the Irish couldn't outnumber us. We built this country and now this racist government are calling us names like aliens. And on top of all this, they want to chuck us out. But if we go, the total labour force goes with us. Ian Paisley came to Leicester. They have Melbourne Road Church on the top. Came in Black Mariah and start preaching about blacks should go back home and this and this is not their country. And I tell you. Remember, they talk about this thing called Great Britain. Mister, the great in Britain is black. There's no white without black. Because everything that England has achieved, whether they nicked it, 
never mind taking all the slaves. I mean, I just get fed up, to be quite honest. I don't want to talk about goddamn slavery no more. We know what we've done. They wouldn't let us in the meeting. We said, well, he came to have a speech about our race and what's, what um, he thinks the, the English people should do about us. Not only about the Indians, the Asians, you know, the black people. So why can't we go and have a... He said, but we know you lot. You're going to make cause trouble. I said, what trouble? We all we want to do is go into the meeting. About three, three black Mariahs came for five people. A load of policemen. And one of us, Dubois, he stood up. And when he finished talking to those policemen, because he was young, a few experiences there. When they finished talking to those policemen, the buttons was nowhere in sight, my friend. No physical, but there again, we took our eye off the ball and they just jumped us and arrested us and we ain't done nothing. All we wanted to do go into the meeting. And I tell you, this is, this is no word of lie. Balunda, me, Zed, Dubois, listen. They want to take us downtown. And that Black Maria didn't go nowhere, my friend. You know, we just, because we just, we just rock it. We, we just rock it inside <laughs> and the police. <laughs> police man jump on it. <laughs> jump on it. Jump on the thing. And so we get out and we just, we just went home. When white people walk on the street, they do so in the understanding that the police will protect them. But black people walk in fear of these same officers, in fear of being beaten up and brought to court on trumped up charges, in fear of being planted and the like. When um, they raided um, black people up in the high fields, like early morning, they would pull them out of the bed, not listening to what they have to say. Sometimes it was people that church, someone from the church would know nothing. They'd gone to the wrong address. They would pull them out, especially the men, and beat them, shut them in the van, take them down there. When they find out there were those um, the wrong people, they don't give them a lift back home. They tell them, get out, you're sorry, get out. You know, I mean, all you're the same. All you look like the same. I've seen police abusing black people because in their concept, all blacks look alike. And I've witnessed policemen arresting innocent black lads. That's when people used to come to us and say, well, oh, last night I got arrested, so and so and That's why we start getting more interested in these things now. Because the people are coming forward now and this is how we start in helping people. We get lawyers for them. Bar and barristers, you know, you know what I mean? When they go to court and things like that. And this is what we are trying to do. Tell you anything you want, we will try and help you. We're not God, we're not saints, but we will do our best, you know what I mean? To, to protect you and to help you and to get you the best service we can because we know as a black man, when you go downtown and you don't have the right solicitors, even say you have the right solicitor, those solicitors down there were two-faced at the time, my friend. They have a couple of judges there, they put you in front of those judges, you know if you're a black man, you're going to prison. Straight away. It doesn't matter what you say, you're going down. Black brothers and sisters, I would like to try and get it over to you what we exactly mean by the Black People's Liberation Party, as it seems that a lot of you think that this party is preaching white hatred. This is not so. I don't get it. It just, it, it makes no sense to me. Um, I think you're gonna have to ask a white person about that one, to be honest, if, if uh, I can't, I can't get my head around it. Cause I think there was a, a line not recently when, um, when they all stormed into Capitol Hall and they were saying, look, we don't want you to start shooting them all, but we just want to be treated the same as you treated them. And that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for anything more or for people to, to treat us better than everybody else. Just treat us the same as you treat yourselves. That's it. I must admit, the, the white people, the white radical people, 
they came on board man, and they could see what was happening and they helped us change a bit of it. I mean, not much change, but at least with a bit more freedom. Truth and right is colorless. So if me see a black man a beat up a white boy, I'd intervene and vice versa because he's a fellow human being. So that's my personal conscience. And I grew with that to this day, um, which, which, which then formulated my social understanding and investment in trying to do the right thing for the right reason for the right outcome. We had um, the Youth Foundation. It was called Youth Foundation. It was started by Zed, Zambalados. Laurel Road Hostel it was meaningful. That was just a small sort of hostel for young black men in the area. For youths who got into trouble in prison, we used to, and, and then when they come out of prison, they haven't got nowhere to go. Not like now, they put you into a hostel and, and then they give you a flat somewhere. They just chuck you out on the streets, nowhere to go. You do cry back inside. I know that it served the community really well when it first opened, it was needed. And it was working well. Yeah, it was two sisters who was actually the backbone of it because they were cooking the food, registering them and doing that stuff. And most of the men was just on the management committee. We had to get it registered as a charity. We didn't know her house. And I asked my mum, can we register? And the first thing my mum said to me, I don't want nobody to have to have meeting and the police come to my door. <laughs> I have to put, say, mommy is not like that. You know, no, all we're going to do is register so we can get the certificate to show that we are registered youth foundation as, as a charity organization. We'll have, we're going to have no meetings here, just for us to get a place as well. And this is how, this is how, so the youth foundation is registered, still registered, and that, re, that registration cannot be changed. I ended up being the chair for a while and we got into what we call stage two, which actually that project went into a housing association. But within that building, in terms of looking after alienated young people, which is what the, the hostel was about, there was two great ladies. We've always been there. We've Our, our stories have always been there, but just because we live in a kind of a, a patriarchal system, you only hear about the male stories. For me, the backbone of a black community has always been women. Uh, men talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. They had a strong role, and the role they played very well, because we never used to have a lot of, of youth girls come, and um, they used to have one-to-one, -one, they used to have meetings with women only at the BPLP. That the, the, the ladies used to go there because we don't want, they don't want to be intimidated by the men. We want them to come and have the meeting by themselves. As the legacy goes, I would like the workshop to be part of that because that's, that's one building we fought for physically. It was the same rebels, the same Black Power lads, obviously older, took a building, um, Maidstone Road. There used to be an Irishman working the man club and it was up for liquidation and the boys bust in and they've never left to this day. They decided, right, we ain't got nowhere to go, we're gonna just hold it. And they, they, the youth men, they went in there and just kept hold of it until the, the council decided, right, we had enough, we're gonna give you the building. That centre became a fulcrum of black people in Leicester from, from my point of view. For although there was an organisation called LUCA, Leicester United Cabin Association, it was, um, it was the senior blacks, the, the, the blacks who would accept what the system would say, and so on, rather than challenge, as the workshop did. And we did challenge, believe me. We put on a show in terms of what could be using that facility. We took kids to Amsterdam in terms of playing football and sharing that. We had artists come on there, you know, and Burning Sphere played there, just the name. Kwame Ture from America came there. Um, the miners, when they're doing the miners' strike from Maggie Thatcher, I've never seen so many beautiful colours in my life when they came with their flags and so on. 
In actual fact, they cussed us because we were selling canned beers and they wanted their prompt beers, you know what I mean? But it was just show you how broad we were. But again, it comes back to the fundamental weakness that I believe to this day curse black people. We can't work together, you know, to build up something strong. I've been saying this for years and we, we try we try to do this to help our black people, but sometimes, you know, we own black people are your worst enemy, really. Marcus Garvey said, if we don't organize, we will perish. And it's always resonating with me. If we don't organize, we will perish. And so he said, so that because every facility that we've had in Leicester, unfortunately, died. This band meant it brought, a, it brought sadness to me, but a joy, some joy as well, to see that um, the, the, my people walking around with their heads up high. I'm really glad that I had that time, and I really, I'm really sad that my kids didn't experience that. With all those experiences, I left the Caribbean Centre where I was a youth activities organiser and stepped up a gear. Um, obviously, I wanted to get on in life, you know. By that time, I've I've started to um, work and look after my family. And I have more time with my family because I had three years of non-stop and then they still come bad in this and this. I thought, well, I've got a family. I can't lose, you know, I have to look after my family. But the same saying that when we, um, when we had the, 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 the riot as well in uh, Leicester, the last thing the council did was um, block off all the roads and dismantle, dismantle the black community and um, gave them big houses, new houses in Bowman, Lee, Saffron Lane, and, um, and um, tell them, oh, you, know, you know, get out of here because otherwise this is gonna happen to you and that gonna happen to you. And, and that, broke, that broke the community back, that broke the back. Just everything went downhill and just wrecked the community. But they realize what happened and it's history. Black Life Matters is just the same as when we were, it's just a different name. Which is a good name coming out now. It's just a different name for when we were doing things because when we used to have marches and demonstration things, it's for Black people who used to get beat up, stop at night time, going home, asking them this question, locking them up for no reason, then letting them go, you know, just, just to show that they, 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 they got authority. It, 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 has, it hasn't changed. Yes, no, and maybe, I think is the answer to that. Yes, we, we know things have changed to when we were growing up, to when our parents were growing up. There is a change. Um, there has been a movement, but it's not enough. Um, so we see small, literal bits that we can say, oh, well, that's better than it was before, but being better than it was before doesn't make it right. Um, and I think that was when, when everything kind of came to light over last year. That was one of the biggest things that I heard from the elders, that they felt that they'd fought for us. And then you come to this situation and they, they, there's a real realisation that nothing has changed. I think for a long time, racism has been hidden and buried. And I think certain political issues that have come up, especially in America and in England, um, it's sort of given people more confidence in being racist. Um, it's a lot more out there now. Before it was more covert, where now it's, it's quite blatant. Back to basics. We've gone back to where we were. All the progress, like using the American model. It's happening in London. It's happening in London. Police and black brutality is happening in London. My sadness, when Take that as a given, because it's not going to go away until you get an organised community to challenge society. And all we do is react when we lose a brother or a sister, for that matter. 
you know. So what happened in the riots when we lost that woman down in Tottenham, the policeman going to her house and next thing you know she's dead. It caused another uproar down there. But we react to these things. We don't, we don't build a foundation to say, hang on a minute, we've got legal minds. We can fight for justice. So we leave it to Lamy 